Now next is the information I'm really happy to provide and that's the introduction to Talia Ely's talk. As you can see the slides are up here but I wanted to tell you a bit about Talia first just to introduce her. So she's the Professor of Developmental Behavioural Genetics at the now known as the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at, here at King's College London. Um, Talia started her career in psychology at the University of Cambridge and from there moved to the Institute of Child Health to study, uh, to study twins and their emotional development and that was her PhD. And then after a short gap in her, um, which I forensically examined her PhD, the short gap I think was travelling in Southeast Asia so she's a well-rounded uh, person. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that she's very accomplished. She won the prestigious Spearman Medal from the British Psychological Society and recent, more recently the Macquarie Excellence Award, as well as many other awards as a, as a young scientist. She's got more than 100 publications. Who would think, just looking at how old she is, it just seems impossible. Um, but actually, you'll, you'll hear about her work on quantitative and molecular genetic approaches, so I'll leave Talia to explain all that. I wanted to just comment on her role in the public understanding of science. It's something which is becoming more and more important for all scientists to do. So she's presented her work at the Pint of Science Festival here in London. She's, uh, her studies on worry have actually been reported in magazines like junior magazines. Uh, um, and she's presented actually at parliamentary receptions as well as, and also at schools. She's also got her own website, who has their own website, to describe all the research that she does so that people can easily follow it. I know that because I looked at it earlier today. Um, but she's also interested in other things like, um, I happen to know from her friends and colleagues, singing, rollerblading, photography, and reading Jeeves and Worcester. So this makes her a really very accomplished woman. We have a series here um, on inspiring women. You may have seen the, uh, the collage we've got going down the, down the stairs as you came here on the women professors here, but the inspiring women event is we invite people from outside of the Institute to come and tell us their life story to inspire the next generation of uh, women researchers and male researchers, of course. I've no idea why we bother really, because Talia is clearly um, uh, an inspiring woman and she's going to tell us all the inspiring things that she's been doing over the last few years. Thanks a lot, Tanya. Well, thank you, Till, for that lovely introduction. And I'm just going to have to stand here and drink in this fabulous view of so many of my favourite people all in one room. It's really quite amazing. Uh, thank you all for making the effort to come. I know it's difficult for many of you and some of you have travelled a long way and I really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, just while I'm on this front slide, this beautiful artwork that you'll see here and there throughout my presentation and on, uh, on our website if you have a look is by my very talented cousin Kay Begbad who uh, did some drawings to represent the multiple things that we look at in the group. Um, twins, cognitions and DNA and uh, I'll talk to you a bit about how those all link together. But first of all, why do I study anxiety and depression? Well, really, first and foremost, because I find them really interesting uh, and always have done. I've always found um, people's responses to difficult situations really fascinating and how they vary. Um, but it's also a very real and increasing problem in our society today, as some of these clips here show. And actually it's become increasingly seen in the media in the past few years, the effects of anxiety and depression in our society. But more importantly, and perhaps more concerningly, is the prevalence of these kinds of problems in our young people. It's now known that anxiety and depressive disorders tend to begin early. Anxiety disorders mostly begin pre-puberty and depression normally by the age of 18. Uh, and the rates of these problems in young children are increasing all the time. And of course, the, the worst outcome of these problems amongst many slightly less bad ones uh, is suicide, uh, which is currently 
the third leading cause of death in our young people. So these are very real problems and it's sometimes hard to get that message across because everybody's felt worried or sad or anxious or depressed. And so when you tell people that's what you work on, it's tempting to think, oh, that's rather soft and doesn't really mean anything. But actually, when you get to the end of the distribution, and I believe passionately that it is a distribution, some people are low, some are middle, some are high, the ones at the high end have a really difficult time managing daily life. Uh, and we owe it to try and work out what's going on to try and prevent and better treat these problems particularly in our children, in order to prevent them getting into some vicious cycle. So um, I'm not going to talk about all the possible influences on anxiety and depression. I'm going to tell you about the ones that have fascinated me and that I've worked on uh, during my career to date. Uh, and mostly I'm distinguishing between genes and the environment. And in particular, two processes by which these um, types of influence uh, co-act. One is gene environment correlation and the other is gene environment interaction. And I'll tell you about more, of, more about each of these as the talk progresses. But before I do that, I want to just go over what I mean by population variation. Um, if you imagine a single rectangle and you want to know its area, you need to know its width and you need to know its height. If you want to know about the differences in area between this population of rectangles, you can look at the differences in their height. If you want to know about the differences in area in this population of rectangles, you need to look at the differences in their width. But of course, in reality, what we really need to look at is variation differences in variation in both the height and the width in order to know about the differences in area amongst these rectangles. And that's exactly the case with genes and the environment. It's fine to look at one or the other in isolation, but if you really want to get the whole picture, you need to look at the both together. And differences in genetics between people and differences in what they experience together contribute to the differences that those individuals express in their behaviour and emotions. And the main methodology that I've used in my work and that I'll be um, reporting studies uh, findings from today is the twin design. And probably many of you are very familiar with this, but just for those who aren't, there are of course two different types of twins, identical or monozygotic twins, who are created when a single fertilised egg splits, creating two genetically identical individuals, so effectively nature's clones. Uh, in contrast, dizygotic or fraternal twins are created when two eggs are fertilised at the same point in time. And so the two twins that result from this are no more genetically similar than any other pair of siblings. So they share about 50% of the genes that differ between individuals. And so if you imagine contrasting identical and non-identical twins, identical twins are going to share all their genes, whereas non-identical twins will share only 50% of their genes. But in contrast, they grow up in families together, both types of twins. And in addition to looking at genetics in the twin design, we also look at the environment. And we distinguish the environment into two types, the shared environment and the non-shared environment. And we actually define the shared environment by its effect. So what we mean is aspects of the environment that make family members similar to one another. So by definition, both types of twin pair will share all their shared environment because we define it as that which makes individuals in a family similar to one another. So here I just show you um, a very simple um, example of how we would explore twin data. This is the level of similarity for a twin pair. These are our identical twins, a group of them here, and here is a group of non-identical twins. This is made up data, but it's very typical. So this is the extent of similarity in our group of identical twins, and this is the extent of similarity in our group of non-identical twins. Um, and the difference in their similarity, we know, has to be due to the difference in the amount of genetic material they share, which is half. And so this difference here can be estimated roughly as half the heritability. And so if we look at what twice that is, that tells us the whole heritability, and any remaining resemblance is due to the shared environment, which by definition is the environment that makes people similar to their family members. And throughout the talk, I hope I've done genetics in dark blue throughout, uh, and pale blue is the environmental influences. I, I hope I have checked that that it's right. Um, we shall see. Um, when we analyse this data, we usually these days use what are called structural equation models, which really map very nicely onto these kind of picture diagrams, which I find a very useful way of thinking about them. What we have here is variance in your trait of interest in the first member of your twin pair, and here in the second member of your twin pair. 
And so first of all, we look at genes, which is often represented by an A, standing for additive genetic. And this correlates across the members of the twin pair perfectly. So the correlation is one. It's the same genes for the identical twin pairs. But for the non-identical or fraternal twin pairs, that correlation is only 0.5, because they only share roughly 50% of their genes with one another, like any other sibling pair. In contrast, the shared environment, represented by a C, because in the literature it's sometimes called common environment, but I will call it shared environment, um, the, the shared environment correlates perfectly for both types of twin pair, because that's how we define it. And then the final element we can look at is the non-shared environment, and that's environmental influences that are specific to any one family member. They make them different from everybody else in their family. So that's why there's no arrow correlating these, because these are influences that are specific to that child, and these are influences that are specific to that child. And that's at the root of a lot of the analyses I'm showing you today. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to tell you a lot of detail about any of the analyses. I'm going to tell you the stories. And if you want to know the details, there's lots of papers you can go away and read. But I figured that actually mostly you'd probably prefer to hear the stories. It is, after all, nearly bedtime. Um, in my house, anyway. Um, OK, so this is a timeline I'm going to use throughout the talk. And uh, I started um, my research career in 93, 94, and then here we are at 214. It's kind of remarkable uh, to me that it's actually been two decades. It doesn't feel nearly that long. Um, but I'm going to use this to anchor things as we go through and show you, I hope, the sort of history of the ideas and how they've progressed in the work I've done with my group. Um, and the two themes I'm going to talk about, so gene environment correlation and gene environment interaction, are show above and below the line each time it occurs. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I began my doctoral work in 93, 94 at David Skews's department at the Institute of Child Health, uh, working with Jim Stevenson. And uh, at that point in the early 90s, uh, there were a few twin studies of anxiety and depression, not many, and all in adults. We knew there was a moderate heritability for these traits, so about 30 to 40% of the variants in a population. Uh, so the um, contribution to differences between people in a population was due to genetics, about 30 to 40%. And substantial non-shared environment, so that's the environment that makes people different from each other. So that would be things like life events that happen just to one particular family member. From the broader literature, we also knew that anxiety and depression often co-occur, they often come together in individuals, both in terms of when you're thinking about them as traits, but also in terms of when you diagnose them as disorders. And this was something that really fascinated me, and it's the theme from my PhD that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, from adult twin studies at the time, uh, there was a suggestion that this co-occurrence in anxiety and depression was due to genetic similarity between the two. Uh, so I was really interested to pursue this idea and see if the same applied in children. So this is Jim Stevenson, and you'll see throughout lots of mugshots of the people that have influenced me and who I've worked with. So apologies to anyone in the audience who doesn't like that picture. Um, Right, yeah. um, so this, uh, this is meant to represent the overlap between anxiety and depression. They perhaps actually should be even closer than that, thinking about it. Um, but we had a correlation in our symptom scores of around 0.4 for anxiety and depression, so a moderate level of association between these two variables. But for genetic effects, we saw just the same as they'd seen in the adults. We saw nearly perfect overlap. So just the same genes were influencing variation in anxiety as were influencing variation in depression. But what was really fascinating was we saw completely the opposite effect for the environments. They came right apart, totally different environmental influences. So the way I always envisage it is you've got a shared genetic diathesis that's quite general, and then depending on what you experience, the environmental influences that you experience, that pushes you towards one particular type of symptom. So then I had the great good fortune to persuade Robert Plowman to uh, let me come and work in his group as a postdoc, uh, and I began work on TEDS, the Twins Early Development Study, and continued with this idea of co-occurrence. And for those who don't know about the Twins Early Development Study, it's really one of the most fabulous resources in uh, UK psychology research at the present time. Um, the sampling uh, structure was all the twins born in England and Wales between 1994 and 1996. And even today, 20 years later, we're celebrating 20 years this year, um, around 8,000 families remain very actively involved in the study, and it remains representative of the UK population. 
And uh, one of the analyses we did in, twin, in the TED study um, when they were in preschool, <coughs> preschool age, around three to four years this was, was to look at a range of anxiety-related behaviours that children express at that age. Um, we weren't going to go and try and diagnose them or anything, and this is parent report data, of course, because these are very young children. But we found a very similar pattern to what I'd shown in my PhD. So we had a shared genetic influence here that had a an influence on a wide range of anxiety-related behaviours in this, in this early um, preschool sample. So I'm now going to tell you about two other studies um, that I set up um, whilst uh, undertaking two um, uh, MRC fellowships, one after the other. And in the first one, I set up a study called Genesis 1219 um, with my mentors Ian Craig and Robert Plomin. Um, this is called Genesis 1219 because the adolescent um, siblings in this sample were recruited from an adult sibling sample called the genetic and environmental nature of emotional states in siblings. These were adult siblings being recruited to look at adult depression and we contacted adolescent offspring of those adults and recruited sibling pairs that uh, um, replied to us. And then we added to that data with twins recruited from the Office of National Statistics. And we ended up with a sample of around 1,500 twin and sibling pairs. And they were aged 12 to 19 years at, eight, at the first wave. And uh, we followed them repeatedly. Uh, and in fact, Alice Gregory has taken over on this now. Um, and I'll tell you quite a few results from that project. And then a few years later, I moved on to a different MRC fellowship and set up the TED's ECHO project, looking at emotions, cognitions, heredity and outcome. This is really a longitudinal twin study, looking at two time points across middle childhood, eight and ten years. And my mentors here were David Clark and Peter McGuffin, and this was my first team. This was Maria Napolitano, who is a fabulous project coordinator who had helped me with G1219 as well, and Jen Lau and Alice Gregory, who were PhD students on the project and uh, we had a lot of fun doing this study. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little more about this co-occurrence theme from both of these projects before moving on to my main themes of gene environment correlation and gene environment interaction. So um, perhaps surprisingly, one of the areas we've looked at the most is sleep problems. And this is really because it was Alice's interest, Alice Gregory. And uh, she's looked at it in a number of different ways across different age ranges across both samples and shown substantial genetic overlap between different types of sleep problems and anxiety and depression. But we've also seen this genetic link with other types of difficulty, more on the behavioral side of things, such as antisocial behavior, work by Richard Rowe, who's done a lot of the data management on G1219, um, and also work by uh, Georgia Michelini and Tom McAdams, um, showing similarly that hyperactivity surprisingly shares quite a bit of genetic variance with anxiety and depression. And then most recently, Monica and Helena have done a lovely paper in which we created scores reflecting all the different types of anxiety disorder that are seen uh, and their links with a depressive disorder scale, and again showing considerable genetic overlap amongst them, the structure of which changed a bit across age, the age range, um, but really again this same idea of quite a general genetic diathesis that underlies a lot of different problems and the specificity of which seems to be more in response to the environment. Okay, so I'll move on to my first main theme now, gene environment correlation. And some of you may be wondering what I mean by that. I'm really referring to the fact that genes and environment don't come about independently of one another. And there are really three routes by which they end up entangled together. And the first is passive. Most individuals are brought up by people to whom they are biologically related. So usually you share roughly 50% of your genes with your parents, but they also provide your environment. So there's an immediate association between the genes you're inheriting and the environment you're being reared in. This next one's one of my favourites, and it's evocative, and it relates to the fact that individuals um, evoke different responses from people. Uh, so I have two images here to indicate the different kinds of responses that you might get, uh, that a child might get, depending on how they use their hands, for example. But actually, this happens from really early on. I mean, even in early infancy, you can see differences between hard to soothe babies and very sociable and smiley babies. And you can see differences in how people respond to them. It happens very early. Early. So that's evocative gene environment correlations because those behaviours have to an extent a genetic influence on them and that is then evoking a response from the people around them. So you end up with this tangle. 
And then active, I think, are really interesting. I always think of them as coming online a little later. Once the child has got to the point where they're making some decisions about how they want to spend their time, and so this image represents a child who perhaps is naturally rather shy, has always been so, and then when they get into a playground setting, they're not comfortable socialising with everybody else. They go find a quiet place to hide and observe. And so then this child has a genetic predisposition to be shy in the first place, and they're also withdrawing from social interaction and missing out on the opportunity to benefit from the experience that that would provide. And so then they're getting a bit of a tangle going between their natural shyness and then they're pulling away from social interaction, the two of which then add up together. So there have been a whole bunch of studies that have looked at these gene environment correlations. Uh, some have looked simply at the heritability of aspects of the environment and we know that life events and all sorts of parts of parenting um, and other um, environments that vary between family members have genetic influences on them and that those genetic influences are often shared with those on the outcome of interest, such as anxiety and depression. And the example I'm going to show you today is one of my favourites, really because it's one of the few chances I've had to um, look at uh, interaction between parents and children using data we collected by observing them, rather than asking them to fill in a form. So this was data collected within ECHO, and we had these mums come in with their um, twin pairs, and then one at a time they had to do this task using an etch sketch Probably many of you know what I mean by an etch sketch but it's a toy that has a line in it and you have two dials and one dial makes the line go up and down and the other dial makes the line go left to right. And um, we tell them there's just one rule. You have to draw this image we're going to show you but you can only use one dial each. So mum has to use that dial, kid has to use that dial. And we gave them something like a square as the first thing, and then we showed them this horrible picture of a house, which I think I would struggle to do even on my own, and said, now you need to try and do this house. So a mildly frustrating task, the children were about eight at the time, and it required considerable cooperation between the mum and child. And most of the time they managed fine, but every now and then the mum simply had to take charge, and she moved to using both dials. And it was really fascinating watching these video clips and you'd be kind of nearly falling asleep with boredom of how many times you'd watch this particular behaviour and try and decode it and then suddenly she'd do this, she'd move to using both tasks and you sort of got this sort of visceral reaction to it really because it didn't matter if they made the house look nice or not and it just felt a really strong indicator of mum wanting to take charge of the situation. So we rated that as maternal control and then had a look at what happened when we analysed the data, taking that into account. So what I've got here is the children grouped into whether their mum um, showed maternal control, so took control of both dials, and whether she didn't. And you can see that the children, and this is their own ratings of themselves, the children who experienced maternal control reported themselves as significantly more anxious than the ones who didn't. But even more interestingly, when we used the twin aspect of our data, we showed that anxiety was moderately heritable. So here's my dark blue part of the bar. So this is the genetics. Well, there's an A up there if you prefer that. Um, so just under 40%. And maternal control, interestingly, was also influenced by the child's genes. In fact, more so nearly 60%, in fact just over 60%. Um, and so the, the maternal control is being influenced by the child's genes, suggesting perhaps it's even being elicited by the child. And something else that suggests that is this final bar here, looking at the association between the two, which is around 0.3, and the largest part of that association is due to genes that influence both the anxiety and the maternal control. So there's something going on here where people are getting tangled up together and what this suggests is that the child's genes are driving this association and so probably what's happening is the mum is responding with this controlling um, behaviour to try and reduce anxiety that she sees exhibited by her child. But this issue of the direction of effects, do parents respond to anxiety with a behaviour or, or do children become anxious because of the parent behaviour is a really thorny one and I'll come back to it with a different design later on. Okay, so then I got a bit distracted. Um, this is mine and Giles' first son, Justin. He was born in 2004, uh, and so I had a little bit of time out of work, time to reflect, you might say. Um, but I uh, carried on working with uh, Echo. I was very lucky that uh, Maria stayed put throughout the period of time I was on maternity leave and kept the ship running. And Alice and Jen carried on doing interesting analyses, and so things progressed a little while I stayed 
at home figuring out how to be a mum, much harder than being a scientist. Um, and uh, the other theme that we were really interested in looking at in the ECHO project was cognitive biases. And I think of these really as how we see the world. So somebody with normal cognitive style, I always picture as somebody with a lovely clear view through an open window or a clear window uh, through which they get an unadulterated view of the world around them. But in individuals with high levels of anxiety, the sort of fight-flight mechanism has gone a bit over-involved uh, uh, over and there's a tendency to be much more uh, um, attending to threat much more than other, in other individuals and also to interpret ambiguous things as threatening where others wouldn't see a threat there. And so there's this sort of heightened uh, sensitivity to threat. Uh, so it's a little bit like looking through a much narrower plane of vision and having a focused view only in on the things that confirm your hypothesis that the world is a dangerous place. Uh, and so we had a look at this idea of um, a sort of anxiety-related cognitive style in a whole range of ways. Um, we worked with Anka Ehlers at um, looking at heartbeat perception, so awareness of one's heart rate, and found that that was indeed influenced by genetic factors and that those correlated with genetic factors on panic and somatic symptoms. And we saw this same association in a whole variety of ways, which I've listed here, and this was in collaboration with a number of individuals in the team. Um, and, um, but one of the things that interested me was that as we found this effect of shared genetic overlap across these different aspects of cognitive style and different types of anxiety and depression, I started thinking, gosh, is this just a function of this type of data we're collecting and it doesn't really mean anything at all? But interestingly, there were two cases where this didn't happen at all, and those were interpersonal cognitions and face expression recognition. So by interpersonal cognitions, I mean people's expectations in social situations with their peers or expectations of their mum's behaviour. And by face expression recognition, I mean the ability to distinguish between different facial expressions. And these, we found in contrast, were not strongly influenced by genetic factors, and their links with symptoms weren't either. Okay, so then I got increasingly distracted. Here's Pasco, and then there's Theo. Yeah, I had them all very close together, a bit mad, really. Um, although Peter McGuffin said, I think it's a very sensible idea, get it all out of the way in one go. Um, and I should say that Peter was an incredibly supportive head of department, and when I first appeared on his doorstep about six months after having Justin said, would you mind if I came back part-time? He said, fine, you'll be very good value. <laughs> um, and actually him and Robert Plowman and Francesca Happe, who've been my subsequent heads of department, have all been incredibly supportive of this aspect of my life and my strong desire to be a very involved mum and not to be at work long days every day of the week. And um, I worked part-time for many years, only work, went back full-time quite recently. And uh, I still work at home two days a week so I can be at the school gates. And uh, for me, that's the only way of doing it. And I really hugely value the flexibility that I've been allowed on that front. And it's made a really big difference to my wanting to stay in science. Um, but the other thing I should say about having three kids close together is it gave me a lot of thinking time. And uh, while I was thinking about what I'd like to do next, um, I reflected on this idea of gene environment correlation and the direction of effects and the fact that we know anxiety is transmitted within families, depression is transmitted within families, but it's sometimes hard to disentangle the direction of effects. You know, do anxious children make their parents more um, anxious or do anxious parents make their children more anxious? We know there's stuff going on in the family that they must be influencing one another, but nearly all studies don't take into account genes and so then you just don't know how much of it is due to the fact that these people all share a lot of genetic influences as well. So the Children of Twins design is fabulous from this point of view because it offers something completely different from the child twin design. So it's another lovely image by my cousin. And uh, here we have a pair of adult twins who've had offspring at a roughly similar period in time. So if you can imagine a set of DZ twins, so these are dizygotic fraternal twins, they share around 50% of their genetic variants with each other and also they both share about the same 50% with their own children. So then with their nieces and nephews, which is called the avuncular association or avuncular correlation, they share about a quarter of their genetic variants and cousins respectively about an eighth. But then you contrast this with identical twins and I just think this is so fascinating because they're genetically identical. They still share 50% of their genes with their children, 
but then they also share 50% of their genes with their nieces and nephews. It's kind of amazing. You don't actually share any more genetic material with your child than you do with your niece or nephew if you're part of an MZ twin pair, and yet you're not rearing them. So you get this disjunction between the level of genetic resemblance and the family environment and the all growing up and living together. I mean, unless they're in some big commune or something, not usually the case. Uh, and um, correspondingly, the cousin correlation for genetic effects is 0.25. So you can use these combinations uh, to disentangle the influences on transmission within a family. And this is work I've been doing with Tom McAdams. And so I'm going to show you some results for anxiety and transmission within families. Uh, and so parental anxiety, we found, was influenced, as we expected, largely by genes and the non-shared environment. And then we looked at how it linked into offspring anxiety. So we had this path showing the 50% resemblance in terms of genes, but actually, much to our surprise, this didn't then influence offspring anxiety. What did influence offspring anxiety were genes independent of the adult anxiety, and I'll come back to that. And then the other influence that was really interesting was a direct influence here, through the environment, from parental anxiety to offspring anxiety. And this direct pathway here really reflects the fact that these people are living together because we've taken out the fact that they share genes that all goes around this route here so this bit is the fact that they're living together and that was a significant path and it shows that there's an influence on the development of anxiety within families that's over and above the fact that they share genes together but notice I didn't say the direction of effect, and that's because with this data we can't actually tell whether this is parents influencing their children or children influencing their parents. We just know this is about living together. In order to distinguish those two directions of effects, we need to add this data to child twin data, and then we can actually disentangle those directions. And that's what Tom's working on right now. He's in here somewhere thinking... Um, yeah, it's not easy. I'm really glad I'm not running these models. Um, <clears throat> So one other thing about this slide is that we, we spent a long time thinking about why this doesn't show here, and we decided that the most likely explanation is because of the different age of the participants. So what we're talking about is the transmission of genes for adult anxiety when we're looking at our offspring when they're still adolescents. Now we know that some genes are very stable and they continue to have an effect across different developmental periods, but we also know that there's a lot of change. And so it's perfectly plausible that the genes of importance for adolescent anxiety are not the same as those on adult anxiety. And so to test that hypothesis, we would need adult twins on whom we had data from when they were adolescents. And of course in time we will have that with TEDs because they're all just turning around 20 at the moment. Uh, so in time as they rear their children we will be able to test that hypothesis which will be very exciting. So that's the end of my section on gene environment correlation and I'm going to move along to gene, uh, gene environment interaction now. So what do I mean by gene environment interaction? Well here what I'm really re referring to is the fact that although we know genes are important for the development of anxiety and depression, and major life events such as losses of, loss of a parent are also very important, uh, there's also evidence that sometimes the combination of the two is greater than the sum of their parts. And so putting the two together, you get a much worse effect than you would expect from simply adding them up. And that's what's meant by gene environment interaction. I hope you all enjoyed my movement there. I thought it was quite fun. Um, so one of the first times this was demonstrated was in a groundbreaking paper by Avshalom Caspi, and he looked at a uh, genotype to do with serotonin, uh, which is a neurotransmitter, and it's the target of SSRIs, which are a very common group of antidepressants, including Prozac. And uh, this particular genotype has two forms, a short form and a long form. And the short form had previously been associated with anxiety-related traits, but somewhat inconsistently. And so, um, using the Dunedin Longitudinal Study, um, they had a look to see whether there was um, heterogeneity in the sample, so differences in the sample, in terms of how the genotype related to depression, dependent on the environment the person had experienced. And they found that there was. So for individuals with increasing number of stressful life events, you saw a separation between the genotype groups. So these are individuals with two copies of the short form of the gene. These are individuals with two copies of the long form of the gene. These are individuals with one of each. And by the time individuals have experienced three or four events, the short, short group 
are scoring quite a bit higher on depression. And this was shown across a number of different measures of depression and a number of different measures of life stress. And we then went on to look at that in our adolescent sample using G1219. Um, we found it only for the females, so that's what I'm showing here. And we found pretty much the same effect. So this is the short, short group. This is, a, um, this is the short, short genotype, and this pale blue line are the ones who have experienced a high level of environmental risk in their family, so low parental employment and education, poor housing, those kinds of factors. Um, but what was quite interesting about this data here um, was that also individuals with that same genotype, the short, short genotype, seemed to do better if they were in environments of high, low environmental risk. So these are families um, with lots of benefits, um, so uh, good housing, good education, good parental employment. Um, and these individuals seem to be protected in some way and to be less likely to be depressed. And this finding and several similar findings were picked up by Jay Belsky, who was developing a hypothesis called the differential susceptibility hypothesis. And he suggested that genes that we've traditionally thought of as sources of vulnerability might instead be sources of plasticity. They might reflect how responsive you are to the environment, be it positive or negative. So they might mean things that um, if you're an individual in a positive environment, you do really well, but put that same individual in a bad environment and they do really badly. So these are very responsive individuals. I thought this was a very interesting idea and it ties in very nicely with the idea of gene environment interaction. So um, the other thing I was thinking about when I was having all these babies uh, was how to think about gene environment interaction in a more planful way. I was frustrated by the fact that if you looked at gene environment interaction with life events, you often had to get there after the effect and you were getting people telling you about a life event they experienced a little while back. And so then you couldn't be sure what they were telling you about how they felt was definitely how they felt at the time because they were looking back at it through the window of having experienced this event. So I wanted to try and identify an experience that we could look at going forwards that we knew would happen and uh, thought about school transition, actually could never get funding for that idea, uh, but um, fortunately got funding for a different idea to look at um, CBT response and we called this idea therapy genetics. Um, and so for shorthand I call this GXT, uh, so instead of it being a gene by environment interaction, it's a gene by treatment interaction. So the treatment is a measured environment. Um, and CBT is the most common treatment for child anxiety in this country, but about 35% of kids don't recover. So they're doing really well, 65% of kids do, but a big chunk don't. And it would be very useful to know up front who's less likely to recover. And there's a possibility that genetic influences could contribute to our understanding of that prediction. So we began with a candidate gene approach and looked at the same serotonin genotype. We had just under 400 children recruited from Reading and Sydney with Jenny Hudson and Kathy Cresswell and um, Kate Lester's been running this project with me. And we looked at recovery from anxiety disorder and also change in severity ratings across the treatment period. And here we see um, pretty much what we hope to see, which is the individuals with two copies of the short short um, recovered at a much higher rate from their primary anxiety and also all anxiety disorders compared to the other two groups. And this was controlling for a whole load of other things. Um, similarly, when we looked at change in symptom severity, although there wasn't much differenti differentiation between the groups before and after treatment, during the follow-up period, the short, short group continued to improve and have a lower level of symptoms afterwards. Um, thinking about how this type of data might eventually be clinically useful, we tried adding it up. Um, so adding up their genotype with another genotype and some clinical factors we knew were important and this is work by Kate and Jenny Hudson and found that individuals with a small number of risks had an 80% chance of recovering from their disorder in contrast to those with a high number of risks who had a much lower rate of recovery. Um, but the sample was rather small, so we expanded it considerably to 10 sites and had a go at replicating. And this is work by Susanna Roberts. And um, this is the previous findings. This is all in the same order. You can see the effects are similar, but unfortunately of smaller size. So this result wasn't quite significant. Although when we looked at it together with the earlier sample, it remained significant. So we think there's something interesting there. Um, 
but we were concerned about the fact that we were focusing on a single gene and wanted to move to more of a genome-wide approach, which is more the way the field is moving generally. So this is work led by Johnny Coleman and Jerome Breen, and what we've got here are markers from a genome-wide array. This is half a million markers across the entire genome, and they're laid out along the chromosomes here. So every single little dot is a data point, and this is how significant they are. So how likely it is that their finding was not to be expected by chance. And really all you need to see is that this region here, which are the ones approaching genome-wide significant, we have a few things in there, nothing above this red line, which is what we would ideally like to see, but our sample is really a bit too small. But our plan for this approach is to combine multiple markers together and come up with a polygenic score that then tells us about variation in genetic influences across the full genome rather than focusing on a single one. Um, another thing we thought would be interesting to do in terms of moving this work forward was to start to look at some of the mechanisms that might be in play, and I'll just tell you briefly about one. So DNA methylation is a process by which a methyl group grabs onto a chunk of the DNA and thereby alters its function, either turning it on or off or altering the amount it produces. And the fascinating thing about DNA methylation is it happens in response to the environment. And a whole host of different types of environmental influences, as I've represented here, can influence this process. So Susanna had a look at this in a subset of our um, treatment response group, um, and these are six different locations along the serotonin gene that I talked about earlier, and she looked to see whether their methylation levels differed across the treatment period, and found that for the kids who got better, they had um, an increase in methylation across this period, whereas the kids who got worse had a decrease in meth methylation. And particularly at this one point, but also this is the average across all the locations that we looked at. And that just came out a couple of weeks ago. Our first paper, very exciting. Um, but again, we need to move epigenome wide. Um, don't have that yet in terms of treatment response, um, but we do have it in terms of um, a, um, depressed twins. So we had a sample of um, monozygotic twin pairs um, from the G1219 study where one member of the pair had been repeatedly far more depressed than the other and the depressed member of each pair was consistently above the clinical cutoff on the measure we used so these were individuals experiencing a very high level of depression um, and then their co-twin was much lower and we looked across the whole genome at um, methylation differences between the more depressed and less depressed twin. And then we replicated this in uh, post-mortem brain samples from adults. And this work was led by Emma Dempster and Chloe Wong. And you can see in this um, figure here, the, um, these are the pairs lined up, and the red one is the depressed um, twin, and the blue one is the less depressed twin. And you can see a consistent difference in the methylation. And this was our, um, our region of greatest difference between the twin twins and there were two or three regions that were, showed a huge amount of difference and when we then looked at them in the brain tissue we saw the exact same pattern of effects uh, so we managed to replicate in a much older sample with a completely different tissue. Um, and then we hope to look at this in terms of gene expression. We're looking at expression changes before and after exposure-based CBT with Jürgen Margraf and Sylvia Schneider who are wonderfully here today from Germany to be with us. And uh, we're also looking at that sample six months later. So that's uh, where we're going with that study and very excited about where that will lead. Okay, so my very last bit of data is just thinking about taking gene environment interaction genome wide. And this is data by Rob Kears, um, work by Rob Kears. And he's been looking at a um, genome wide analysis of genes predicting differences between identical twin pairs. So because identical twins are genetically identical, any differences between them have to result from the environment. And so what we've been looking at is differences in depression and looking for genes that predict differences in depression. So these are really genes for plasticity or responsivity. Uh, and what we did was create a polygenic score reflecting this environmental responsivity. That was a bit of a royal we, actually. This is what Rob did. Um, and then... Um, he looked at this uh, polygenic score, which is down the bottom here, standardised it, so naught was the um, average across the population, and then grouped um, the individuals in TEDS um, by um, how optimal the parenting they reported receiving. And you can see there's a big mean difference, so the ones with less good parenting are showing higher depression scores. But what's really interesting is that as they get to the higher level of this polygenic score, 
they separate out a little. So there's a greater difference here between these two groups than there is back here. And this approach of creating polygenic scores and then looking to see what they predict uh, in, in, in related phenotypes is, is a, an, um, a direction we're really interested in pursuing further. So that's the whole timeline. I hope I haven't um, garbled my way through it too quickly. Um, I thought I'd just say a couple of other things before I end. Um, the next 20 years, uh, where do I think we'll go? Well, we hope to extend the children of twins with um, combining it with child twin data and making it go longitudinal. Um, I'm really looking forward to when the Ted's twins are old enough uh, for us to look at them as children of twins. Um, I think polygenic scores are the way forward in terms of the genome-wide analyses and we'll be able to create scores for individuals and look at those with respect to multiple phenotypes. Uh, and I hope some of the work we're doing in therapy genetics will lead to individual therapy choices in time. And in the end, I think in our lifetime, we will see babies sequenced uh, at birth. And so instead of doing um, the heel prick tests for individual disorders, I think we will see sequencing um, and this type of genetic information will be used to individualise medical um, treatment throughout the lifespan. Um, so I'm ending with a couple of slides of uh, important people, so three very important boys. It wasn't always like this. Every now and then I felt like roaring back at them, um, but uh, now we're through the, through the hardest part. They're all school age now and life is a little bit easier. Um, I've worked with some really wonderful people and had such a happy time doing all of this. And uh, I've listed some of the most important people here in the therapy genetics work and then several other teams are, are, are listed here and very importantly the fantastic support staff at SGDP without whom none of this would be possible. Um, and then just to end on a most recent photo of my team last summer and of course none of it would be possible or nearly as much fun without them. Thank you. Well, I was very pleased to be asked to give the vote of thanks um, following your talk because I knew it would be a lovely talk. And I hope it was inspiring for a lot of young scholars here, not just those of female persuasion. But for me, it, it was a special pleasure because it gave me a chance to thank Talia for being such a wonderful collaborator for nearly two decades now. Looking at her and how young she looks, it's really hard to believe that it's been 20 years. But I do remember first meeting Talia uh, in 1995, when I, uh, just shortly after Judy Dunn and I came here. We were the first people hired as part of this SGDP center that Mike Rudder and David Goldberg had set up and was funded in um, 1995. Have I been saying that right? 1995 um, by the MRC. You get the decades mixed up after a while. Centuries, probably. And um, I remember that talk because it tells you about a distinctive characteristic of Talia. Um, we had a, Judy Dunn and I had a, a wonderful group, eight postdocs who were doing great stuff. We were really off and roaring and getting the TEDS project started. And then Talia was finishing her PhD, um, as she mentioned, at the Institute for Child Health. Uh, she finished it in, in 1996. And uh, in, 19, in, the, in 1995, she came to talk to me about this new twin study I had started with the possibility of having a postdoc with me. And when I realized that, we went to lunch. I, you know, I thought, eight postdocs cannot possibly have another postdoc. So I tried to explain this to Talia, and she just wasn't having it. And so <laughs> at, the, at the end of lunch, she said, you know, kind of in parting, well, I'll look forward to seeing you in September when she finishes her PhD. I realized somehow I had promised to support her. I remember coming back to the center. Uh, we were in those uh, old Georgian houses on Denmark Hill, 113 to 115 Denmark Hill. And Jill Dale, whom many of you know, is the uh, research quality guru or whatever for the institute now, uh, was the first business manager at the center. So I sheepishly went to her and explained uh, I had promised support, you know, for this person as a postdoc. At least you could get away with doing it then. I mean, you, you didn't have to go through all the bureaucratic rigmarole. But I did, I know, I saw, I left, and I saw Jill shaking her head, kind of wondering what I had for lunch. <laughs> and I knew what I had for lunch, and that was Talia. <laughs> um, 
it, as Talia had decreed, her postdoc then did begin in September of 1996. Uh, and it really was one of the best things that's happened to me at the Institute, as well as at the Center, for reasons I'll describe. And after a two-year postdoc, Talia received two five-year MRC fellowships. And then she became reader and now professor uh, at the Institute. So you saw in her talk that she tied together her research with two themes of GE correlation and GE interaction, the two central themes of our SGDP center. Um, and trying to figure out some things to say for this talk, I took Talia to lunch last week to ask her about the GE correlations and interactions that contributed to uh, her career. And it was a somewhat drunken lunch, but with Talia, that takes about a drink. And the, the, the first thing that she mentioned, though, uh, was what I, exactly what I experienced firsthand 20 years ago. And that was uh, being, de that's determination and um, a sense of self-confidence. And she thinks that was the most important thing her parents gave to her, whether it's nature or nurture or probably both. And she also says that it's one of the most striking characteristics in her three boys which doesn't make for easy parenting. So in addition to her parents' influence on her determination and sense of um, self-belief, I guess, uh, Talia talked about uh, her husband Giles Grant, who's here tonight with us, who fosters the same traits in her. Now, you might think this couldn't possibly be genetic, right? That there's no inbreeding going on here, even though they are quite remarkably similar people in terms of some of these characteristics. But I think assortative mating is actually a very good example of GE correlation writ large. You, you mate with people who are similar to you genetically on these, or at least compatible with you genetically on these important characteristics. She also mentioned some specific traits like um, her father's math skills. He's also here tonight. He was in finance before he retired. And Talia says uh, that helped her feel uh, comfortable with maths. And it made it easy for her to pick up the uh, very sophisticated, complicated model fitting that she just very briefly described in her talk. That's a, a necessary part of quantitative genetics. And again, this could be nature and nurture, although in this case, I'd bet more on nature, I think. And at our inebriated lunch, Talia started talking about some uh, seemingly chance events that shaped her career. For example, she talked about two inspiring teachers she had at A-levels, one a math teacher and one a chemistry teacher, who made her excited about science. And although she assumes that's chance, I bet it really isn't. Um, for example, how many other girls were in the class? Why was Talia taking advanced math and chemistry courses? And second, it's probably a safe bet that um, not all the other students in those classes became similarly excited about science as a result of it. So I don't think luck is necessarily luck. Do you know that um, measures of luck, chance, life events, show genetic influence? And although luck is defined in terms of uh, events that occur by chance rather than through one's own um, actions, it's clear that some people uh, make luck happen. And I think traits like Talia's determination and self-belief are examples of that. And I think this correlation between genes and environment is how genotypes develop into phenotypes. It's a really key process in development. And it, uh, Talia seems a good example of these GE correlations when you consider the key ingredients in her success that she didn't mention during our lunch. And I just wanted to mention three that I think are particularly important. I, I, I'll grant her the determination. I've experienced that on a number of occasions. Well, first, I think Talia is the, um, soci the most socially intelligent person I know. She just amazes me with how perceptive she is about other people. And that's not nothing. That's just not, you know, that's an important factor in why she's able to bring together those huge groups of collaborators who aren't often the easiest sort of people to work with. So I think she's brilliant at that. I also think it uh, stands her in good stead in working with her many doctoral and postdoctoral students. Uh, second, the second trait, I think, is that she's extremely well organized and planful. And uh, being well organized seems to be the sine qua non for successful women in academia who are also mothers. But an, an interesting aspect of this, she expects other people to be that way too. <laughs> and I find people raise their game to meet her expectations, as I think her students will attest. 
And then the third trait is one that probably gives it grown a bit. We're getting a little bit too soft here, and it's kind of an unfashionable word. But I have to say, Talia is nice. For 40 years, I've worked in interdisciplinary settings, and I've found that niceness is probably the most important ingredient in creating the esprit de corps that you need to get people to work together in these interdisciplinary environments. We have to trust other people. And that's partly why I said earlier on that Talia's joining the SGP Center in 1996 was one of the most important things that happened to the center. She just gets that esprit de corps going because she is such a nice person. Now, the modern usage of the word is uh, agreeable, which is okay, but it has a very murky etiology, etymology coming from Middle English connoting foolish or stupid. But perhaps we need another word that's less cliched and less overused and less misused. And as is often the case, Yiddish does pretty well on these things and with the word mensch, which means human and humane being. So join me in this vote of thanks to our newest professor, who is not only highly determined, but socially intelligent, well-organized, and a mensch.